Well, welcome to the Love Does podcast. My name is Jody Luke, and I'm the executive director of Love Does. Love Does cares for the vulnerable, fights for human rights, and provides education in conflict zones. And we show up in some really difficult places and seek to love our neighbor really well. We've been growing like crazy the last couple of years. And this past year, we expanded into our 14th country, Mexico. And uh, we operate about 15 to 20 minutes south of the San Diego, uh, U.S., uh, Tijuana border. And it's actually the fourth largest, busiest land crossing in the entire world. Get this, 106 million single crossings just happened last year, which is pretty crazy. And that includes a fair number of asylum seekers. Asylum is a form of protection that is granted to foreign nationals who are seeking uh, um, some protection from not being able to return to their home countries. If they were, even in the, in the years to come, their life would potentially be in jeopardy. And so the U.S. is the number one destination for asylum seekers. And as I said, we have this uh, really large refugee camp that is just south of the border, houses a number of uh, families there that are seeking asylum legally, and our staff became aware of uh, this refugee camp last fall, and we uh, traveled to visit there a couple times and saw a number of kids just running around the camp, and uh, we saw an empty building, and so we thought we would launch a Love Does School. And it's really one of the reasons why I love doing this podcast is because we get to highlight real time what Love Does is doing in places around the world that are facing some of the biggest challenges. Uh, immigration, of course, is included in that. And wherever we work, we seek to find some dynamic and uh, trusted leaders like the one we have on our podcast today. So our guest on our podcast today, Help Us Start That School, was really instrumental in doing that. And uh, she has a story of her own. I'm always blown away by leaders who step out on faith at great sacrifice often to themselves and work in some really difficult and uh, constantly changing environments, developing countries where sometimes there's some insecurity and often do it at very little compensation. And it takes a great amount of fortitude and courage and resolve. And our guest on today's podcast has all three certainly in abundance. So welcome to the podcast, Yanina. Hello, Jody. <laughs> it's great to see you. You look great. Hey, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, where you're from, and how you got to Mexico, and why you're there. Yeah, that's always a fun story to tell. Like, I remember when we were talking, like, just right before school opening, and uh, I ended up telling you a little bit about where I'm from and like how I ended up there. Originally, I'm from Switzerland and I've been in Mexico for almost three years, spending most of my time at a refugee shelter. And like that by itself is always a fun story to tell. But basically, I've known Jesus my whole life. And as a, and as a child, I had all, all of those dreams and like passion to like go out into nations and just tell people about God. But while I was a child, like, it was not possible because, like, I used to be very sick and also, like, almost completely deaf. And so, like, I had all those dreams and passions inside of my heart of just knowing who Jesus is and who Jesus was to me in the midst of my deepest struggles and having that passion to, like, bring that to the people who need it the most, which is usually outside of Switzerland. I never thought that would be possible. And now, like, fast forward, like, I've been working in Mexico as a ref refugee for a little bit more than two years. And it's just been the wildest journey of my life. So you're a Swiss working in Mexico. It feels like that's like a Netflix series, like one I'd like to watch. Hey, how many, how many languages do you know? I would say it depends what you count. So, like, my first language is, like, our Swiss German dialect, which is Bandage that we learned high German, we had to learn French in fifth grade, then English in seventh grade, and now more or less Spanish. I mean, it puts Americans to, sh Americans to shame. I'm always amazed all over the world how many languages people know. But Switzerland, oh my gosh, I mean, you know you really have to have a heart for people to leave that country. That is a gorgeous country. I know our beloved colleague was traveling there this summer and, and visited you. And my son has is, is been 
uh, hiking through Switzerland. Uh, incredible. I mean, the Swiss are known for what cheese and chocolate and Alps and trains and all sorts of really amazing things. So I, I love that you've, it's pretty remarkable that you are in Mexico uh, during this time, but you live uh, pretty close to the camp and you, uh, you're you there almost every day. So tell us a little bit about this, uh, the largest camp in the Americas, this refugee camp uh, for families seeking asylum. Where are they coming from? How many families are there? Uh, and what are they fleeing from, you know, where, and where are all the countries are, that they are arriving from? Yeah, it's a really, really special place. Like, I remember when I stepped foot into the church, like the first time in December 21, and I walked in there, I'm like, I've never seen a place like that. Not necessarily because it's remarkably in a beautiful place, because it's just in a hidden valley that's full of pigs and trash. But it's this really, really special place that has been around for, like, as a refugee camp for seven years, just offering refuge to whoever needs a place to stay. It's a church that opened up its door, started with taking in Haitian refugees back in 2015, and then from there just started expanding. So at the moment, we have roughly 1,500 people that are currently with us. Most of them are families with kids. And at the moment, a lot of them are Mexicans coming from the south of Mexico. But we also have people from El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala. We have one Russian person at the moment. We have people from Colombia. We have people from Cuba. So basically, just people from all over the place that, for various reasons, had to leave their homes and are no longer safe to, or were no longer safe to stay where they were at. So they come to Tijuana hoping to find protection in the U.S., hoping to find asylum, which, I mean, I'm not going to talk about politics, but it's a, it's a rough journey. And so at the moment, like most of those families are with us for like eight to nine months until they get a chance to legally present themselves at the border. And during that time, a lot of the people just live on the streets. And the unique dynamic is that these people, they had to leave home, not because they're just looking for a better life or because they want to make more income, but it's actually because like their lives are in danger. There's a lot of things that the world doesn't know about. And there's a lot of things that I can't even talk about here, but South of Mexico is completely lawless. There is cartels that have been taking over everything and so like the families and if if you take time to just sit down with them and listen to their stories they will tell you how so many of them just from one minute to the next had to leave so they they pack up what they can in a backpack in 10 minutes and they just run out of the door knowing that they can never go back In your time there, I, I think you had told me that almost like 20 countries had been represented at some time. Is that, a, is that an accurate number? Yeah. And there's, I think, about 1,800 people there, but they all have to be families, right? They, you have to be, not anyone can just join this camp. Is that right? Yeah, so like that's one of the priorities that we set. As long as it's people with kids or family units, we take them in. We also have some single refugees at the moment that we always explain to them those are the basic rules if you're willing to follow them you're more than welcome to stay pastor pastor Gustavo who leads the camp he always says like we like offer a place to the ones who need it the most it's it's not a hotel it's not necessarily pretty but if you need to stay and you want to stay like you're more welcome to do so but like his heart or all of our hearts is not so much oh yeah, let's, let's get them all into America. Like that's not our main goal. Our goal is to keep them safe, give them a safe space where they can be and then tell them about God and just help them to restore their lives and set them up for, for a better future. I love that you, th you describe it as a beautiful place in this valley that's full of pigs and trash. Uh, you, you really are a special soul. And I think you alluded to it earlier, but I want to highlight it. You know, I don't know that when you were young, you ever envisioned that you would be spending 
some of your years in Mexico. And I think God put on your heart some dreams and visions with regard to your future. And it's been really beautiful to see how he's weaving that right now uh, during your time in Mexico, just in terms of uh, speak a little bit about, if you wouldn't mind, your vision for all the nations. It's one of the things and it's still like so mind blowing for me because stuff like that only God can do. But I remember when I was a little girl, I was dealing with a lot of, of sicknesses and I had hearing problems and I also was really, really shy because like I just got scared of people. And so one of the things that like helped me to like keep on going obviously was Jesus, but then the other side was just reading books. And I would read through like whatever books I could find. And one of our missionary friends that at that point was in Afghanistan, she brought us this book that says Pray for the Nations. And it's like this beautiful, big, colorful book that has like all the different nations and different tribes and people groups in it. And then like listed on it how you can pray for them. And so like I would say on my bed or on our couch just read through that and just pray for like all those nations and just read about them and I had this fire deep inside of me I was like I want to go so badly like I want to go see those places that like I could just imagine in my own mind also knowing that it would be absolutely completely impossible and now to see how that is coming through is just completely mind-blowing because like I always say like I also got like, I don't care where you sent me. I don't care what I'm doing. Like, I just want to serve you because like, I know him and I know him so well that I know that he is so present when we need him the most. And I just like want to go wherever he goes. And now, yeah, that having led to Mexico and helping to lead one of the biggest refugee camps is something that I would have never imagined. Well, I just think it was so unique that you were praying for each one of those countries as a little girl, and now you're encountering all of those countries all in one place through this refugee camp. And there's been some crazy stories. I was actually reading where 350,000 babies have been born to refugees over the past five years. Pretty remarkable. But a couple of those babies were born in the Mexico refugee camp and you help deliver them or there's a baby named after you. I mean, real. I know you have story after story after story. That being said, babies, kids, they really have always had sort of a special place in your heart. And when you're at a refugee camp, they need so much. And so in some ways you think, well, then is education really that important? But can you talk a little bit about kind of the role of education with these kids during this time? Absolutely. It's one of those things where it's hard for people to imagine. Like even when I was back home and I was explaining to people like what I'm doing or like just the layout of where we're working. And I always tell them like there is, so we have 1,500 people and roughly 800 of them are, are minors. And they're just, before we had the school, they're just running all over the place. And because the thing is, a lot of those family units, like obviously, they come out of the most traumatic circumstances you could ever imagine. And like a lot of them are, for example, are single moms where you don't know where the dads are at, a lot of questions. And even like the, the parent that is with them doesn't necessarily have enough brain space to be present with them and to like actually help them like work through their trauma because they're so focused on just surviving. And so these kids are lacking just basic attention, but also like basic education. Like I always joke with them because like, it's part of my job to like go scold them if they're doing something that I shouldn't be doing. So they're all scared of me, but they love me. But like just the like daily kind of like fight to like keep them in line. And now to have a school where I know they get to learn basic skills and just even, you can't even imagine like how much it costs our teachers to like just have like 20 kids in a classroom, sit down at their desks and be quiet. Like even just the super basics that like in the US, like obviously you learned that from preschool 
and in best case like it would be the same thing here in Mexico but like a lot of these kids haven't been in school for a couple of months some of them a couple of years we have teenagers that know don't know how to read or write and so we're trying to set them up for success and having the laughter school at the shelter where the kids don't just have a safe place for them to be kids but also to to start learning their basics and then to prepare them for once they can hopefully go into the U.S. and integrate into the U.S. school system is a huge step. Well, it is because almost all of those kids will be crossing over the border and will be in American schools at some point. And so for some, I think this is their first entree into formal education, which is wild. And I really have to do a shout out to the staff. You know, Alejandro is the headmaster and has a great heart. And we hired all of these teachers. And it's one thing to teach. You have to love kids. Uh, it's another thing to teach in this context because it's really a, a difficult context to teach in given the different varying levels of education. But they really view it as a calling uh, and a serving to their com their community and really even the international community, uh, especially during uh, what has really been a global migration of people in the last several years. And so it's quite remarkable. And, you know, as I said, we stood the school up pretty quickly and you were instrumental in doing that. So thank you so much. What did you notice that once the school opened, what was the impact on the refugee camp? I think even from the beginning, like you could see the change and you could see the impact quite quickly where like obviously the, the kids finally have a place where they felt like they belonged, having a like their classroom, their teacher and just somebody that's giving them direction, that's giving them education. So they're taken care of and they're actually growing and they're learning, even though like obviously it's, it's a constant battle and I'm absolutely amazed by our teachers who are dealing with them on a daily basis. And then like the other side of that also means that like during that time where the kids are in school, their parents have time for themselves where they can just breathe, they can go take care of laundry or whatever they need to do. So like by the time the kids get back from school, the parents actually have more brain space available and just it, it helps them to, to calm down and just slowly make it out of the survival mode and just learning how to love their kids better. Because Love Does is headquarters is in San Diego, so it's just right over the border. We've been able to visit quite often. And our staff just came back and they were amazed by the emotional IQ of the kids and how it's grown by leaps and bounds. You know, at the beginning, when you would go, you'd see kids with their shoulders down and their head is down and they were making eye contact. They were confident. They were hugging, uh, you know, staff members, you know, they know them, but that would not have been possible before. They just didn't have the, the confidence. And so much of education is more than just ABCs and one, two, threes. It's really the intangible that's communicated that, that you matter and that we believe in you. And you could see right away the confidence just just building them. It was pretty remarkable. And I, it, it's interesting with a lot of the stuff that we do within Love Does, we know when we've done something significant uh, because some of the local government officials go way out of their way to help. It doesn't happen all the time, but it feels like in this circumstance with this Mexico Love Does school, it's really been the case. I know we just met with the Mexico Department of um, or Education Secretary, and she was talking about how to fast track accredit the school, which is crazy. That rarely happens. And it also reminded me that we had the grand opening, you know, not too long ago, and there were a number, number of local Mexico officials that really made it a priority to attend. In some ways, that's to the testament of you and the pastor who have developed those relationships. But it was a beautiful day. We were on the soccer field. It's not really a field. It's like a cement indoor area. And uh, and the kids were preparing their dances, and they had done just a remarkable job. But it was really a day filled with joy. Uh, one of the things that um, really st stuck out to me was that as these kids were performing, uh, for the grand opening ceremony, the parents were lined up around this soccer field. And it dawned on me 
because a lot of these kids had not had access to formal education before, they probably hadn't done a school performance before. And the parents had never had the opportunity to watch their kids do a school performance. I know as a parent, I'm a parent of three. That's one of the most proud moments when you're watching your kid uh, just flourish. And I watch the kids be so proud, but I actually watch the parents be even prouder watching them. And it was just a, it was a beautiful moment for me. What stood out to you on that day? Because it was a great day. I think it's definitely like one of those days that we will all remember. And I mean, just going back to what you said, like just watching the parents watch their kids. If you ask any of those parents why they left their home, why they left everything behind, they will never tell you it is because of me. All of them will tell you because I want my kid to actually have a better future. I want them to to actually be able to make something out of themselves and not fall into the same traps of drugs and crime. And like the parents did make the sacrifice and are still making those sacrifices so that their kids could actually have a brighter future. And I think that day was just one of those marking days for the kids, for the parents, but also for each one of us. Or it's like, this is like, I just remember like sitting there and whispering to the person next to me, it was like, it's so worth it. Just looking at the kids performing full of joy. Because like, as I said, like it was very fast and the, the weeks before the opening were definitely super, super hectic. And like, there was a couple moments where I was just like, Jesus, like, give me strength because like the to-do list never seemed to end. And yet sitting there and just looking at the kids and like, I know those kids really well because I spent so much time with them and just looking at them and like <laughs> looking at them. No, I can only imagine. I love that you said it was super stressful leading up to it because I could only imagine how many times you thought, is it really worth it? And then I love that as you're watching those kids, that 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 thought came into your mind that it is worth it. It's one of those things where we're building something that's just way above and beyond what any any one of us could do by ourselves. And I remember going home that afternoon and just like with that thought in mind everything was worth it because I remember when I first came to the camp like a little bit more than two years ago they just started building that school building and you need to understand like people are carrying bags of cement up the hill people are carrying block by block up the hill and like for a couple days like I was actually one of them that just helped and we were like building something because pastor had like that vision of like, Hey, I want my kids to have access to education. I want to set them up for a better future. And so we built the school buildings, like actually like a lot of the migrants like helped in that project, knowing that it's not their kids that will receive education, but it's the kids that will come after them. It's the generations that will come after them. And so they built that school building and then for like more or less a year, we were waiting and praying for the right people to come along. And then you guys came. It was us. (laughs) It was you all along. But obviously like, we didn't know. And Pastor just had like that dream. And like people always say like, he's a crazy visionary, which he is. And so like we built the school block by block, cement by cement, and then just waiting and praying and then having like the big opening day where we could see the the results of it and just knowing like that's what it's all about and this is why we do what we do well it was inspiring i one of the pictures that came to mind also from that day was uh this little girl she had a heart on her cheek and she was holding um her, the flag of her home country, and it was Honduras. And during the ceremony, we highlighted whatever countries were there at the camp, and we played their national anthem. So she was holding the flag while the national anthem was playing, and I couldn't help but think she's experienced more than what any kid should ever have to experience. You know, some of these families have even gone through the Daring Gap, and if you know anything about that, it's just 
there's just some really awful, crazy stories, but they've, they've made it to this camp that now is a camp of safety. And here she was holding her flag. She may never return. And then afterwards we had a joy festival, which I love. There was full of bouncy houses and food and that particular girl kept entering my line of sight and her face was just full of joy. It was just smiling. It was what a kid should be experiencing. But I thought it's the kind of joy that's also chosen. It was defiant joy because if you looked around again, it's a, it's a valley that is full of pigs and trash. And yet she was choosing joy, this defiant joy. That's really beautiful. And it was inspiring. It was inspiring that her family, um, They've continued to move forward and not get stuck, and it takes a tremendous amount of courage. I think you've mentioned it before, but a lot of these kids are in this really unique season of waiting where they're they're not in their old life and their new life has not yet come. And so it's this waiting period, and in that period, I think everything is magnified. And I think it's also magnified and remembered when people are kind. And it seems to really stick with them. I think it's one of the things that love does, does best. Because we enter um, the seasons of people's lives all over the world when it's really difficult. And it seems like it's full of hopelessness and maybe fear on their faces. And then when you encounter them and you provide education and resources, you see it's often replaced by love and joy and peace. And that was so evident in that day. But as you're thinking about those kids and what their life is going to look like in the future, what do you hope that they remember from this time at their camp? And what do you, what are your prayers for their future? As I said, it's like this unique in between time for them of leaving everything behind and not, not you not yet knowing what they're going to step into. And it's so crazy to see how oftentimes it's just like one single person that can make such an impact of a child. Like I know that there were studies to be done, like if you just have one person that believes in you in your childhood, like that actually gives you all the the power that you need to like believe in yourself. And I think that's what those kids are being able to experience now. And like there is like always like in the midst of hundreds of kids, there's always like some very special ones that just stick out. And then just knowing that like further down the road because like the road ahead is hard it's not like oh yeah once they're in the states everything is going to be fine they're going to be in a new country with a language they don't yet speak with a culture they don't understand not knowing if they can ever go back and for them to like actually find peace within themselves is something that is only up to god and yet, like, my prayer is always that during the time that they're with us, because, like, sometimes it's just a couple months. Sometimes it's half a year. At the moment, it's eight, nine months that they're here. It's probably going to get even longer. So, like, during that time, like, I want them to be able to grasp that somebody sees them, that they're not alone, that God loves them, and that there is purpose for their lives. Because, like, I know how traumatic their lives have been up to this point, I know how traumatic it has been for them to leave everything that they've known, and especially as kids. And yet, like, what my hopes and prayers for them is that they can grasp that love, that God loves them, that he has a plan for them, that there's a purpose for their lives, for their pains, and that they'll find the strength to keep on going forward and then actually make a difference because like that's the future generation whether or not they'll go back to their countries whether or not they'll stay in mexico or stay in the united states like if we are able to raise up the next generations with kindness and compassion and the backbone to actually stand up for what's right like that's the change that we'll need well that's pretty it's pretty beautiful it's it's not a easy task to start a school and all the people that have to come, you know, around it. I love the picture of the participants at the camp actually carrying, and it's a pretty steep hill up to our school, the cement on their back. But there's ongoing needs. And I, I want to highlight, especially this round of the podcast, just if people want to engage in some of the 
extra stuff that we need. I know that there's some infrastructure needs. I know there's some, we're looking for shade over the playground. Uh, I know there's some security things with cameras and internet and some of the infrastructure in the classrooms that we're still wanting to build out uh, if we're able to get some resources. I know some of the at the very beginning, all you're looking for is teachers and a really great headmaster, and we have that. And then very quickly, it becomes evident that you need some support staff to really care for these kids in the way that you described that we want them to feel. And a school psychologist is really important for that. And so having some extra resources for that that group, um, I know that uh, the Kevin Love Foundation reached out and they they worked with our teachers on a mental health training and gave some some mental health exercises and activities to do, but that's really important. And so if anyone's listening and, and they want to participate and help support some of these ongoing needs that we have, you know, I just want to encourage you to go out to our website, lovedoes.org, or you can always reach out at hello at uh, lovedoes. Uh, but it's, um, it's just, uh, it, it's a beautiful thing when you have all of these people coming around this particular school to build up these kids. Are there any other needs that you are really kind of on the forefront of your mind that would be great to highlight? It's always a good question. Um, at the moment, there there's are so many. There, there's always, there's always more, but yet, like, I'm always like, I'm so grateful for everything that we have. And it's, it's just, it's such a blessing at the moment the government is actually finally building the road. So like our whole like entry is a construction zone. And yet so it's absolute chaos, but we're so grateful that we'll have like a safer access. I think part of the bigger issues that we're facing is like electricity. We're hoping to like actually like connect it to a transformer of energy so that we have stable energy because there's days where I know that even just in the past three days like I had to put in three reports because we're just without electricity we're working on setting up a better camera system just to keep unwelcomed visitors away <laughs> and so just basic infrastructure that like little by little we're improving because we also know that like it's those basic things that will actually help to set a be better learning experience for the kids and for everybody because like one of the main things i always tell people is like before we're actually able to like impart something into the people like they need to like feel safe and they need to feel seen and just have a place where they can actually just like stop looking over their shoulders and like start looking down in their notebooks but if the kids are constantly just looking over their shoulders they're not yet able to really start to learn i love that Stop looking over their shoulders and start looking down at their notebooks. Wow. I love it. Well, hey, Matthew 25 informs a lot of what we do at Love Does, which is the hungry and the thirsty and the sick and the stranger and the naked. And don't forget those that are in prison. That Jesus says that when you do for those groups of people, you actually do for me. And earlier in Matthew 6, it also talks about that when you serve the poor, that you don't have your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And uh, you Nina, I don't think your left hand knows what your right hand is doing because you're doing so much, especially for the exact people that Matthew 25 is talking about, which is the hungry and the thirsty and the sick and the stranger. I mean, it's really a beautiful thing. But it just, it reminds me that he who began a good work in you as a child uh, is certainly carrying on to completion. And I know he's still going, but it is a beautiful thing for me to witness and to watch and to, to cheer you on however we can. I have been really personally inspired by the way that you love with compassion and empathy for uh, these families and these kids, not just to help to meet their physical needs, but there's a real priority on their, their emotional and their spiritual needs, which quite frankly, I think will uh, serve them even better in the future. And so thank you for standing in the gap for these families and for these kids and for making them seen, feel seen and valued and for leading with such courage and love. It is really a sight to see. And we're so, so very grateful. So thank you for your time today, Yanina. I really appreciate it. And, um, and let's just keep going. Thank you so much, Jody.
Hey, everybody. It's Bob Goff here. Uh, I've been part of this great caper called Love Does for quite a while. Uh, and I want to thank you for listening to this podcast. If you want to have some more information about Love Does, you can go to lovedoes.org. Uh, you could also email hello at lovedoes.org. Um, thanks for listening to the podcast. Here's the important part. Do something. Whatever that is. Don't just agree with what you heard. What's your next courageous step? See you later.